Welcome to the Lighting Your Way podcast. I'm your host, Guardian Nurses founder, Betty Long. During season three, we'll be delving in deeper to the amazing lives and stories of nurses and other healthcare professionals from around the country. We'll also be talking with a few of my nurse advocate colleagues at Guardian Nurses. You'll get a behind the scenes peek at the healthcare system, as well as get advice on how to get the best care when you or a loved one is a patient. In this, our second episode in the Legends of Nursing series, we talk with Mary Rogers Schubert, recently retired from the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing. Mary and I have gotten to know each other through our work as board members on the Nightingale Awards of Pennsylvania Board. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Welcome, Mary Rogers Schubert, uh, to the Lighting Your Way podcast. It is uh, great to have you here, and I I look forward to having our conversation. Thank you, Betty. I'm honored to be here, especially being counted among legends. And I know some (laughs) of the folks that you're having are very impressive. So I'm very honored about that. And I always enjoy our chats. Yeah. Well, no, thank you. And and of course, you're a legend, you know, at least... (laughs) As as a friend said, there I'm a legend in my own mind. So mm-hmm. um, we'll 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 at least make you a legend. So Mary, what I what I've been doing uh, is is talking with uh, you know in the podcast we typically talk with nurses or patients and and review cases. But what we're doing for the month of May, which is Nurses Month, thanks to the A and A, we are talking with uh, nurses who are typically retired. Um, and, and have practiced at least 40 years, which is why I think you're a legend. Um, and we want to talk about you and talk about your life and your career. So let's start off with kind of an easy question. Uh, you know, tell me about the early days. Where were you born? You know, what did your parents do? Well, I'm a native Pittsburgher. I'm born here and raised here and really haven't deviated probably five miles from my original home. So <laughs> that, that part was sort of boring. Um, come from, you know, a typical um, middle-class family. My dad was in the early days of television, um, did TV technician work his whole career. My mm-hmm. mom started out as an overseas telephone operator during the war and then became a homemaker. So her home was her castle and um, shames me every day about how I keep my own home, but we'll not talk <laughs> about that at this, at this right. stage. But, uh, That's another um, episode. <laughs> exactly. A whole different uh, ball of wax. Um, I'm one of four children, uh, have an older brother and then two younger sisters. So um, that's, uh, you know, we went to parochial schools locally. And um, when I finished high school, went on to uh, nursing school. And and what was uh, that? And so where your mom wasn't a nurse, right? A lot of times uh, nurses are, you know, crediting their moms or their grandmoms Mm -hmm. that were nurses. But what was the inspiration for you to become a nurse? Um, I was an avid reader in school and, you know, those nursing books, Clara Barton and all the different serial books that were out in the um, 60s and 70s. Um, okay. I read those and thought that was fascinating. And um, I thought that I would enjoy it. And so my mother was a little nervous whether that would, you know, w- what I was reading in a novel might be true in real life. So she <laughs> encouraged me to um, do some volunteer work. So I was a candy striper oh. and um, in high school and worked at one of the local hospitals in um as luck would have it, um, they assigned me to the emergency room, which was, oh, you, know, geez. you can only imagine, fascinating. Um, uh, and it was in a larger um, Pittsburgh hospital that got a lot of um, accident cases and things like that. So it okay. was never dull, <laughs> to wow. say the least. So wow. and, um, I was the run and fetch it girl, you know, that, uh, <laughs> when, you know, they always needed something to do some procedure that they didn't have. So I knew my whole way around the hospital and, um, you know, saw a lot of what I thought was fascinating things. But I think the biggest thing that influenced me there was um, at that time, that hospital had a school of nursing and 
the student nurses had a rotation through the emergency room. So I thought it was fascinating watching the nursing instructor with the students. And the nursing instructor was lovely. And, um, you know, she knew why I was there because she had asked me my interest. And so she really included me when she'd be talking to the students, you know, just in general, letting letting me listen in to what, you know, what I would then find out was like pre-conference and post-conference kind of thing. And um, I just, I was fascinated on how they learned. And, you know, those days for those that went to a hospital school of nursing, you know, you had a lot of on the job training and, you know, seeing these things, but she, she did a very nice job with talking about whatever, they were learning in class and how she was trying to make them see the parallels. And so, um, you know, I just thought it was fascinating. So I made up my mind while I was a candy striper that what I was going to go to that particular hospital school of nursing because I felt, you know, it was destiny for me. But lo and behold, that school of nursing closed my senior year and oh. I was devastated what I oh. would do. But luckily, the same instructor was very kind, and she told me, she made a recommendation, I will say, a strong recommendation. And here, lo and behold, it's where her colleagues were going to work after the closure of this school. So she had every faith that this school would be a great place for me to land. And so that's really how I chose my school of nursing. Wow. Very cool. That's good. So that was the uh, so Western Pennsylvania Hospital School of Nursing. So what, yes. it was that in Pittsburgh. Yes. yes. Okay. And West is that still? What what did it become? Is it still open? It's still uh, West Penn Hospital School of Nursing is still in existence. In fact, we're having a reunion this weekend. It's so funny that you should we should oh, be talking great. about it. Okay. Um, but um, it is still in existence. The hospital has merged as many hospitals have with other hospitals and it's part of the Allegheny Health Network. But okay. um, back then it was an independent hospital. And is it still a uh, diploma school? It is. And now wow. they do offer college, um, a cooperative with one of the state colleges, Clarion, and you okay. can get an associate degree. Okay. From they can graduate with an associate degree and then be able to go on. When we were in school, um, I think we did 30 college credits, and that was with Penn State at the time. Okay. We did okay. all our sciences through okay. Penn State, Penn which State. was nice because when you went on to school, you didn't have to repeat anatomy, physiology, chemistry, those fun subjects that every nurse just loved. Right. So, so uh, when you went to um, West Penn, uh, school of nursing. Did you live at home or did you uh, commute? No, there was I a mean, nurse. Uh, to live at the hospital. They had a nurse's residence and um, oh. we all lived in a nurse's residence. So, and it okay. was funny. I grew up going to parochial school and my parochial school, the order of sisters that had, that we had also had a nursing division of sisters that ran a hospital locally and the sisters were not happy that I chose not to go to their hospital but as I told my mother you know I really wanted to branch out you know from the (laughs) the religious order little did I know that all nursing schools could have been a nunnery back in the day. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. I was going to say, and that's where, right. That's where the I say the nursing cap came from. Right, they're trying to exactly the whole yeah. habit thing. Yep. So, so what was your? So you went. It's interesting to me that they allowed student nurses in the ER. Right. You know, because that's often a fast paced environment, not, you know, not you don't have a lot of time to just slow it down and teach people. So mm-hmm. was that what was your first nursing job? Did you go into the ER or? No. Well, they wouldn't let new graduates go to the ER. There were, when I graduated, it was, um, you know, they really wanted people to start out in a more medical surgical area. And so that was the strong push. Like you had to wait to go to the OR, wait to go to OB um, or even ICU. Unless, although as time wore on those, the shortages prevented that 
waiting list kind of thing. And okay. people were allowed to go there more quickly. So I started out as a staff nurse on a 48 bed med surge unit and that, you know, got everything from soup to nuts. So, I mean, it was a great training ground for, um, you know, a new nurse for sure. And was it at West Penn hospital? Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Walk right uh, across the street. We had an interview and then they posted a letter on the bulletin board and said what your assignment was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like, e it's kind of like an easy, uh, easy recruiting tool, right? To have the it, homegrown nurses right there. Oh, uh, and that's, then, that's why nursing schools were so popular. And plus right. the, there was a Medicare pass through thing back in the day that they got. So I think that made it very much affordable for them too. Oh, to, right. Do you, um, speaking of money, do you remember, w one of my uh, friends asked me this when I was talking with uh, Marsha Davidson, do you remember how much you got paid your first uh, nursing job? Yes, I do. $700 <laughs> a month. <laughs> I know. Wow. I oh, know. Wow. Okay. Yes. And wow. I, we thought it was a fortune. Sure. Well, sure. And it, I mean, it was 19, what, 76? 1976. So. Yep. So I mean, girls went out and got apartments. We all bought cars. Oh, <laughs> Not wow. Not sure how we did it. <laughs> yeah, really. It's 700 a month. Wow. I can't even. Okay. That's sobering. <laughs> it <Good>. is. <laughs> and thank it God is. things have changed a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. So you quickly, so now I understand. So you had 30 credits on board at Penn State already. So mm -hmm. that's why you quickly went to get your BSN degree at Penn State, at, at Penn State, right? So you. Right. Well, that's why I continued at Penn State. Yes. And, and I have to say our school, our diploma school was emphatic because I'm sure many people remember at that time, there was a huge push, you know, the different deadline dates that it was going to be mandatory BSN education for nursing. Right. Unfortunately, right. you know, I've retired and we've still not gotten there yet. So, um, you know, but um, they, in, they instilled that in us to, you know, keep going and get your bachelor's degree and go on and get other degrees, depending on where your interest was. So I did start back um, within the next year to um, get my bachelor's degree part time. So it took a little bit longer, but, uh, you know, it, it was it was OK. It, I I always felt they made it very um, there were a lot of hoops to jump, jump through. Okay. Okay. And, and th then again, you went on to, after your BSN to get your master's degree, um, I, at Carnegie Mellon. I so did. They had just tenure, started, right. You're go ahead. I was just going to say they had just started their, um, master's in public management and they had different tracks and they had a healthcare system track that was made for, people that worked in healthcare that wanted to move on into administration. And I had already mm -hmm. um, thought that that was an area that I had a great interest in. And so I took that track. And one of the other reasons I did feel that I wanted to broaden my education a little bit from just nursing and to learn a little bit mm -hmm. broader view of healthcare. So that's why I went to Carnegie Mountain and it was a fabulous education. Okay. And how long uh, did it take you to, to do years. the master's? Three years. And you're working full time or are you starting a family at this point? Um, I, I was working full time through my getting my BSN and I got married and I was pregnant when I signed up to start my master's course. So <laughs> baby was born in August and I started school in September. Oh my God. Wow. And wow, I went okay. back to work. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Were you working uh, three to 11 or day shift? What were you? Um, by that time I had, I was a head nurse, which is what they call, now they call them unit directors in many instances. And then I had just taken a job as a recruiter for the hospital because it was starting into the, um, one of the one of the first shortages in my career in the mm. 80s where um right. there was a shortage of nurses so all the hospitals started to have um, recruiters and i okay. took that job so what what um you, you talked about wanting to broaden your education what what led to that like 
right? Like your track, you had gone to a diploma, you'd gotten your BSN, and then you want to branch out a little bit. What what was motivating you to do that? Just the the desire to get into ed, to um, healthcare administration. Well, I I saw that you know just even being a charge nurse, all the different skills that you needed to figure things out, you know, okay. um, planning assignments, um, being parts of committee, hospital committees and things like right. that. And at that time, that was not something that was very well outlined in any nursing education, or at least not the ones that I had participated in. So, okay. you know, going to um, a, a different type of academic setting really was very enlightening for me. Mm. And and is that what made Carnegie Mellon so memorable? Yes. Was a, yes. Okay. They, and they had a wonderful knack of, you know, like we took a unionization course with a man who had been a union organizer and really gave you a great history about why at one time unions were so vitally important in like their evolution or mm. we took a marketing course and because of the shortage, it was wonderful to see, you know, the um, kinds of things that marketers do to attract customers or people to want to buy their product or buy into their product. So right. it was just a extremely enriching um, yeah. thing for me to look at so many different aspects that definitely had some part to play in healthcare. Yeah. So, I, and I think that even now, um, some of the nurses on my team, you know, they've always been nurses, right? And they haven't varied from that mm -hmm. uh, track or or that world, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a different world to to kind of dip your toe into the water and experience, you know, marketing discussions or finance discussions, uh, things like that. It's it's fascinating if you're interested in it, right? If you're not, it, it's it's kind of like, uh oh, <laughs> why well, am I in this meeting? It's a foreign language. It's a foreign language, number one. And if you're exposed to it and you don't understand it, then you feel very intimidated. Right. Right. Um, okay. So you take a 20 year break, and I'm going to imagine that maybe you had more <laughs> your children no, it was, asking. It wasn't 20. It was 10. Tenure. Okay. Tenure and then you go break. back to University of Pittsburgh for a yes. doctoral degree in yes. nursing practice. And you graduated that in 2014. So tell me what led you to that decision. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. The tenure break was a work break. I, I had changed jobs from West Penn and went to a small um, hospital to be an assistant director and then director. And by that oh, time okay. I had it had had my second child and to be the director of nursing and have a small child. And my husband was building his law practice. No one was home. So someone, oh. someone had to be okay. home. Somebody, least, had to be. <laughs> somebody had to be here. And um, <laughs> so I, I say I took a 10 year break, but my husband said I was never home because I got into a lot of community service. <laughs> kind of thing I was home. But um, then when I was ready to go back, when my children were old enough and I felt that I could do that. Um, I was trying to look for some flexibility. And again, you know, because nursing has so many facets, you know, I started to look at education and those kinds of things. And one of the things that I had gotten involved with, as I mentioned, was community activities. And I had gotten quite, um, I had had, some good success. And again, I had taken a fundraising, one of my courses at Carnegie Mellon was a fundraising course with a, a very known, well-known um, fundraiser. And so I had done some community fundraising and Pitt School of Nursing wanted a director of development for the School of Nursing. And oh. I put my resume in and oh. the dean called me on the phone and said, I never knew a nurse that knew how to raise money. <laughs> That's where it comes from, Mary. Nice. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. So that, that's great. Oh, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. And and at that point, were you like the first? I mean, I can't imagine that University of Pittsburgh had a lot of nurse development officers. Is that what, like one of the first or, or did well, they for I the nursing the first, department? I, I was the first. They had had development officers in the past, but never a nurse. And they it, it, it was probably one of the most fun jobs I've ever had because <laughs> it has a long history. You know, they you know, 39 was their first class. 
And so mm -hmm. I was talking to these alums, and talking about people that are legends and yeah. like Lucy Kelly, who wrote books on the nursing and Mary oh, okay. and some really well-known known people that graduated from Pitt and I got to meet them. It was such an oh. honor and privilege. And then to watch these very successful, and many of them were women, want to create a legacy to donate money to build a better nursing program. It was one of the best jobs I ever had. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's cool, right? So you're th yeah. and and did you find that the, I mean, you know, you often read not often, but occasionally you read these stories where, you know, a nurse has le left, you know, millions of dollars to the school and nobody even knew about her, right? You were you were hunting her hunting them down. Well, you know what? That was exactly <laughs> it and it and it was funny cuz the development people that I worked for in the university, you know, nurses were never on anybody's radar screen unless they happened right. to marry someone wealthy and that person was on their radar screen and i just know from my first job i didn't make a ton of money but they had a fabulous pension program that um, and when we were hired my very first job the woman that hired me again one of my mentors she called us all into her office and I said, we only made $700 a month, but she made us. And I mean, you did not leave that office till you signed the paper that they took out whatever the percentage was because they matched it two to one. Oh, and, oh. and the thing is they took it out before you got it. So you didn't, you never missed it because it wasn't right. there. Okay. And, you know, we all like when I left there, I must, you know, they sent me cause I was rolling it over and in 10 years time, they sent me a $20,000 check. Wow. 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 That's great. Good for her. And I, right oh, for making. And, and we all thanked her in the end. We hated her when she did it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, but again, that was a nurse that she, and she was a nurse and she understood that this is what we had to do. And she was one of the first nurses when the laws changed that she bought her own house home because she could get a mortgage in her own name so she taught uh, her how to do that oh wow what laws chain wait back back me up there were laws that in, did not allow in, here in pennsylvania back before um it would have been like in the late 70s early 80s a law was changed that a woman could independently get a mortgage oh my god in the it, 70s and 80s yeah can you did you know oh that my god no i did not know that yeah. Wow. Oh, I don't think it was that peculiar to Pennsylvania, but it could be. Wow. That's like, geez, we, we had the right to vote in 1920, but we couldn't buy yep. a house till the night. Right. Wow. Well, you couldn't get the loan. If you had the mm. cash money, I guess you could buy it, but uh, you couldn't right. get the loan. Wow. Yeah. Cause I, I guess there weren't a lot of women working and mm -hmm. stashing money away to buy right. But and that's the whole thing about the development, you know, that there were many nurses that never married and did, you know, through their careers and built great careers and, you know, wrote books or whatever they did. And, you know, they left some very mem memorable gifts that right. were able, like um, Dr. Chafee was a anatomy and physiology chat teacher at Pitt who wrote anatomy and physiology books for nurses and they were used all over the world. And, you know, she had a sizable fund that she used to do scholarships, to redo the anatomy and physiology lab. You know, mm -hmm. it was fabulous. Wow. So, so that was your first entry. So you had this doctor, the doctoral degree in nursing practice. Well, I know I didn't have the doctorate yet. I went there with a a master's degree oh, from okay. Carnegie Mellon. And then um, I did two capital campaigns raising about $5 million wow. for the school. And then I sort of got a little burned out. The travel was a lot. And then my kids were turning teenagers. So again, somebody had to be close to home right. okay. <laughs> to watch what they were doing. <laughs> right. Especially then. Right. <laughs> but um, so um, my dean, I was talking to my dean and she said, are you ready for another capital campaign? And I guess I looked less than enthusiastic. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> she goes, you were a recruiter in the past. She needed a recruiter. Um, 
to recruit students for the school. So I switched from development to back to recruiting, but this time recruiting students into our different programs, both oh. undergraduate and graduate programs. So that was my next thing that I did at Pitt. Okay. And then what other roles like did you continue? And then my last, it, well, after, then at one point, my dean called me into her office and said she, the person that was the continuing ed person was leaving and she wondered if I would be interested in that. And I was, and recruiting gets tiresome again, the travel piece. And I said, I said, I might, and they were opening up a doctor of nursing practice program. And one of the tracks was in administration. And she goes, well, while you're doing that, then you could get your doctoral degree in that. So it's hard to say no to the Dean. So off I went yeah. to graduate school. That was the 20 year hiatus from um, oh, okay, my okay. Last academic endeavor. And when you were working at Pitt, was the tuition free? Did you, could you go to um, the there, doctor. there was a sizable reduction, yes. In, oh, that's it, great. You just sort of did costs. So, no, it's wonderful. Yeah, that. I mean, that's half the, well, it's more than gift. half the battle. Yeah, It's a gift. Definitely. I, yeah, for sure. Um, so that's what, so, at, you know, at, on our, in our work on the Nightingale board, so mm-hmm. that's why you have kind of scooched around to the development role, which makes well, sense. That when I was still in development, my dean asked me to, again, the, my dean was big on asking us to do things. She <laughs> asked me if I would join the Nightingale board. Denise Sharon Pachanik had been on the board as a faculty person, and she knew they needed a development person. And, she had, oh. and I was still in development at that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're you're single handedly keeping us afloat. It seems. It seems so. Thank I don't you. think so, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when when you look back on your career, right? Uh, I mean, I know mm-hmm. you're recently retired, and you have grandchildren, and you you know you have a full family. Like, but but it sounds like there were a couple nurses along the way who who may have uh, served in the role of mentor to you. Mm-hmm. Who. Is there anybody in particular or a couple people? Who who were your mentors? Well, Janet Weber is the um, nurse that I met at Presby's ER, who was a faculty member there. And she went on to be um, the director of the School of Nursing in Philadelphia after she left Presby. And I'm going to oh. blank on the name. Okay. Oh, Janet Weber. Okay. Yes, yeah, Janet Weber. And um, I kept in touch with her for years. She was um, really great. There were some wonderful nursing faculty um, that I had in nursing school at at the diploma level who were so professional and really, um, and I think sometimes this gets a little lost with all the other things that goes on, really taught about professionalism, like how you Mm -hmm. look. And that, you know, the cap thing I can come or go about, but, you know, just looking like a professional, whether you're right. wearing uniform, whether you're wearing scrubs, whether you're wearing street clothes, that you look professional. And, yeah. and I think that they were really, you know, that was something that they instilled on us. And, you know, they said, you're, you know, you're treating people that don't feel well, you know, they deserve to be looking at someone who looks the role and looks the part so that, you know, they feel confident in your abilities. And even as a student, you know, that they thought that that was important. And that always stuck with me because you see some, some of the folks that go to work and they look, you know, like they just crawled out of bed and you're like, oh, yeah. wait, you know, someone, you know, do something. So that was yeah. really important. And then um, the woman who hired me at my first job, Alice Duffus, who we're still friends today, she okay. was, um, she had been the head of the OR and then she switched to the head of nursing personnel they had their own nursing personnel office and she was vitally important as i said you know helping nurses in all kinds of ways you know how how a nurse could buy a home how a nurse could go to college you know pay for college those kinds of things she was just great but then some of my supervisors even um pearl shaw you know walked up to me and said one day, um, you're going to be on the policy and procedure committee. And I was like, really? You know, and I wanted to give (laughs) reasons why that wasn't going to happen. But, you know, you couldn't do that. But, and she said, it'll be good for you. It'll teach you a lot. And 
and it did like it was networking like policy and procedure everybody in the hospital had a representative on policy and procedure from every department so like when we didn't get something from pharmacy i knew somebody in pharmacy to call and say hey can you find out why we didn't get you know whatever drug we're missing or dietary or housekeeping, whatever it was. <laughs> so it taught you those things. In addition, then you did become quite knowledgeable about the policies and procedures and why it was all so important. You know, everybody likes to think they know how to do things, but, right. the, you know, in way before we had what is known today about standards of care and that kind right. of thing, right. that was it, policies and procedures. And, you know, nurses really helped build that. But everybody in the hospital had to go along with it. So it really emphasized the role of nursing, I think, and well, um, it, give us a seat at the table. It, well, and Mary, what, you know, just talking with you, it, I, I know you from the Nightingale board, but I, I think what what strikes me is that you were really receptive to all of these suggestions, right? As a way, not that you knew it at the time that you were growing or mm-hmm. learning a new skill, but that, that something in you must have been saying to these women and nurses, you know, ask Mary to do it. So, you know, <laughs> give yourself some credit. I think you were very receptive to it and then took on the challenge and, and, you know, made it your own. So kudos to you. Oh, well, thank you. I, I yeah. just think, you know, it just afforded me great, great opportunities. And like you said, you learn something at everything you do. And I think that's the other thing that I really learned that, and I always feel sad when somebody says, I'm just a nurse or, you know, nobody, I can't do this or that. I'm just a nurse. Our skill set spreads all over a million things. So, you know, it, is way beyond nursing, way beyond healthcare. And, you know, we, none of us give ourselves enough credit for the things that we know and do. Yeah. Well, I I always say nurses should run the world. Um, Yes. I think we do. We just don't take credit for it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So let me, so you've been in academia, but let me, Mm. let me ask you a question about the current, um, education of nurses you know certainly we've come a long way since uh the days of the schools uh where you mm-hmm. well i guess you still bsn you live on campus but um wh- what does when you look forward f- you know having been through what you've been through in your career when you look forward 10 years 20 years wh- what do you think educating nurses is going to look like will it change um it has to change. Um, it has to continuously change. And and the, the one thing that I've learned in all my different academic ventures, it's sort of easy for academia to sort of get um, frozen, you know, because they're so rich in tradition and blah, blah, blah. And the pandemic certainly um, shook that up with them having to turn on a dime and go to Zoom and um the different ways to get clinical hours in with uh, during the pandemic and they couldn't go into the hospital. So I, I think that one of the best lectures that I've heard recently that just talked about, you know, we've learned so much that we cannot go back to the way we did things because now we find new ways to do it that are better and more enriching for um, our students. And then Healthcare is just so, it continues to change so much where healthcare is being delivered, you know. And I mean, when I was in school, we actually went out with home care nurses visiting people in their homes. Now, yeah. that went by the wayside because of insurance issues and, you know, all kinds of oh. issues. But oh, okay. that's going to have to come back. Because, you know, hospice and home care and those things, you know, that's where so much home is being done. And many people, and I'm sure from the work that you do, would um, have even greater stories that it's, for many incidences, it's the better way to do the care. Right. It's, you know, in their home with their families so that there's that support system and, you know, they get get what they need when they need it. And so I think that's going to, 
you know, education will continue to change and continue to develop. And and I really hope, and I, I see it at Pitt, we just got a um, new, um, well, he's not new, but relatively new um, dean of the School of Medicine and head of the health, as senior vice chancellor for the health sciences. And he's very into interprofessional education. You know, okay. there doesn't have to be a nursing AMP and a pharmacy AMP. And, you right. know, we could all learn that together. And again, start that <laughs> um, networking and camaraderie right. much earlier. Yeah. And, you know, I think it will be much more rich, much richer. My, my like when I I have some friends who are um, creating programs at new colleges uh, in the Philadelphia area, one in particular, and she, you know, she showed me her skills lab, and it's mm -hmm. mostly like you know video games or like it's it's mm -hmm. just wild to me, right? The the, mm -hmm. the old skills lab where you were there, you were doing something, and and an observe, you know, nursing mm -hmm. instructor was observing you, and now it's a computer assisted skills lab. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to, maybe you're saying, okay, what are you going to do next? You know, student Jones and they pull the wrong or hit the wrong key and boom, you know, <laughs> it's like, right. but what about the patient? Like, what, is there any interaction? My concern mm -hmm. is that with the young people now, I, you know, a lot on their phones that they don't, are not developing the communication skills that they need to be successful in any workplace, much less nursing, where you have to have a relationship with someone. That's that's um, my my concern. You know what, Betty? You you have hit a very important button there with that. And students come into school in any healthcare profession, but certainly nursing, and they don't know how to make eye contact and sit and mm -hmm. have a conversation with people. Which, you know, no matter what that's the way you're going to get information when you're doing your patient assessment and interviews. So right. that has become a very important part. And they, one of the big fields right now in simulation is having mm -hmm. actors come in and having the students sit and interview them. Oh. And it's, you know, most uncomfortable for many of the students. And I'm sure we've all been in doctor's offices that we say they never looked at us. They were too busy typing on the right. computer, you know, Correct. while we were there. So, you know, we see where that gap has been yes. created. And now in education, they're really starting to, um, address that and and they have um, these actors come in and do these um, simulations with students and you know it, it it's funny and sad all at the same right. time how uncomfortable right. the students are I will say on the whole nurses do a somewhat better because most of the people that go into nursing usually are a little bit more outgoing and will, be more conversational, but that's okay. not always the role. But right. um, you know, you will see it a little bit better there. But I, we did a simulation with med students one time, nursing and med students, and I, it, it had to be one of the most frustrating things I was ever in, just wow. because of that kind of, you know, they just didn't know how to talk to anybody. Right, right, because most students are young. You know, they're they're. Mm -hmm. 20s, right? And med yeah. students, same thing. And you expect a certain maturity and, I, you know, uh, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but it has to be brought out. That, that's, you know, that's my, it's all, communication has always been an issue in healthcare, but I think it's going to get worse as the young mm -hmm. people grow because I don't see them talking to anybody, just texting. Right. <laughs> and, well, you know, if they expect happen. patients to text them, I, I, that's not going to happen. Right. Well, they they de definitely need to, you know, keep that in the forefront in planning the educational activities. I agree. Well, and also I, as a as an aside to the what you were talking about, the uniforms, like mm -hmm. I think that's important also. And to look the part, to <laughs> carry yourself as the to your point, I'm in charge. I have your care. I'm you know, you can count on me right. um, when somebody's looking a little disheveled. It doesn't in, ex exude confidence at all. No, um, not at all. Okay, so Mary, here's two questions. Uh, you could say anything you want to all of the graduating nursing students in the country in May and when they graduate. What would you say? Well, I would 
congratulate them and compliment them on choosing to be a nurse. And I, <laughs> I still, after 46 years, feel that it's the best profession that anyone can choose if their heart is in it and they like hard work. And it just gives you so many avenues and right. so so many opportunities to do it. But I caution them and tell them to please get involved in some level. So, you know, it's not just a job. It's, you know, if you're looking at a specialty or you're interested in a certain field, you know, but get involved with the association that mirrors that interest to help you grow and develop or, you know, just that whole activity. Keep keep abreast of what's going on in the legislation. You know, we right. just put our head in the sand and then, you know, we don't realize that, you know, other groups are taking our job, you know, taking pieces of our job because they right. saw an opportunity that they could do it. And I have nothing against, my example is always pharmacists, you know, that they, you know, they jumped on board given vaccines and things like that. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's not brain surgery. Yes, they can do it and certainly can do it well. But, you know, nurses can do it. And nurses also then assess other things. You know, it's not just, you know, giving that injection. So I just, right. you know, we have to be broad minded and, and get involved with, you know, boards and uh, at community activities. We bring a lot to the table. And, and I would always encourage nurses not to um, you know, don't play that. And, and I get, especially with the 12 hour days, cause I'm not real sold on that's the best, um, way to do it, but we're probably never going to pull back because they like the time off schedule better. So right. they'll kill themselves for 12 hours. But, right. you know, I get that it's hard then to think about doing something else after a 12 hour day, but, you know, we always fit in what we, what we want to fit in. That's true. That's true. I I do think getting involved is really important, particularly in professional, in your professional organizations, because it does, besides the networking, which is, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of a good for, for career growth. It's mm -hmm. also that you're, you know, you're contributing, which feels good. Right. right. Um, okay. So here's a fun question for you. So I, <laughs> I've heard from my friends in Pittsburgh uh, that there is a healthy rivalry between, of course, Penn State and University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> so having graduated from Penn State and the University of Pittsburgh, what side of the football stadium do you sit on? Oh, I'm hell to pit. Sorry. <laughs> it, it has been very good to me. And I was there for 22 years. So um, I do have a bigger allegiance. And then, you know, I, again, because I had gone back for a degree um, and how and it's how people are, how the programs are developed for people going back for that BSN. It's such a laborious thing that it's right. not something that always makes you warm hearted about it when you're finished. So, wow. you know, um, okay. and, and there's. There has to be a better way. I don't know what that is, but there has to be a better way. Well, now that you have time and you're retired, you can think about it because you, uh, you still you still got some creative juices left, Mayor. Besides what your work is on the Nightingale board, mm -hmm. um, maybe you can come up with a better model for BSN. No, I still I work with my I still do work for my alumni association at West Penn, and I oh, am cool. on a couple other committees and, and things. So no, I I'm I haven't given up the ghost. It's not, not it's nice not to have a everyday job you have to go to, but you know, that's <laughs> well, and you get the, you, you fill it up with a bunch of other jobs. So that's all. <laughs> right, right, right. That you're not getting paid for. But thanks to your mentor putting that mm -hmm. money away you have a little yep. stash in the you know in the well, bank. They, they taught us how to save so that's great yeah. you know because when you didn't make a lot of money you didn't that was not saving was not high on your hit parade <laughs> <laughs> exactly right well congratulations and listen have a great time at the reunion oh we I will hope. we will, will it be well attended it's not too bad we um there's a loyal following from there we have um the oldest 
folks that are coming are from the class of 1944. It's an all school wow. reunion. Wow. Great. Yeah. Where's it at so in, in Pittsburgh? It's somewhere? in Pittsburgh at, at one of the hotels. Yep. Okay. So well, have a excited. wonderful time. It would be, it'd probably be a great event to just kind of hang out and talk with all the legends of nursing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> It'll be lots of fun. And I so appreciate you doing this, Betty. I can't wait to hear all the different podcasts. I'll be looking for them. I always get your emails. Thank you for okay. including me. Oh, really? Thank you for taking the time, Mary. I always enjoy talking to you too. So thank you. Right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll tune in next week when we continue our Legends of Nursing series. As it is the month of May, I would like to wish all of my nursing colleagues and friends a very happy Nurses Month. May you be acknowledged and appreciated for who you are and what you do. Thank you for joining us this week. You can find the Lighting Your Way podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google, YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you liked what you heard, tell a friend and leave us a review. You can learn all about Guardian Nurses Healthcare Advocates on our website, guardiannurses.com. So until next time, find some joy in your life, pet all the good doggies and kitties, and remember to tell your people that you love them. Take care.